welcome. I'm Gloria Palmer. I'm the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. And it's really nice to see all of you here. We are thrilled to be hosting our third annual GMAL debate here at the library with these three gentlemen who most of you are probably familiar with. Before I introduce our moderator, I have a few announcements. I'd like to ask that you silence your cell phones. I'd like to thank GMAT TV for their support once again as a media partner and for videotaping today's talk. Um, you can go to their website and search for several of Green Mountain Academy's lectures um, that we've done over the years. It's a form of outreach that we so very much appreciate. So thank you, GNAT. A big thank you goes to the Keelan Family Foundation for their support of this event. Um, many thanks to Don and Beryl, who are here. Uh, Don is here in the audience today, so thank you. We are truly grateful for this kind of support, which is critical to our success. During the Q&A or um, portion of the event where you can um, make your own comments, uh, we will have three microphones um, that will come around. So if you have something to say, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you, because it's important that everybody can hear uh, your comments. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Stephen Sinding. Steve has lectured for Green Mountain Academy, Academy numerous times and is one of four moderators for the Headlines Discussion Group, which we offer each season. He was Director General of the International Planned Parenthood Federation in London. He has a 20-year career at the US Agency for International Development and served as Senior Population Advisor to the World Bank and later as Director of the Population Sciences Program at the Rockefeller Foundation. He was clinical professor of public health at Columbia University. Dr. Sinding serves on a number of boards and works as an international consultant. He will do the honor of introducing our two debaters. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Sinding. Thank you very much, Gloria. And before we go any further, I'd like to ask for a really big round of applause for the staff of uh, the Green Mountain Academy of Lifelong Learning. They do a fabulous job. <laughs> it's thanks to them that these wonderful programs get put together and that they run so smoothly. And we're all very grateful, Gloria and Liz. Um, could the timing of this debate <laughs> have been any better? I, I think not. It, uh, it's, uh, it, it is so timely, and clearly the timeliness as well as the relevance of it explains why so many of you have chosen to spend this uh, late afternoon and evening with us. Uh, Derek and Peter and I have had a lot of discussion over the past six months over the topic for this year's debate, but in the end it was easy to reach consensus on the question of whether or not our democracy is in peril. <clears throat> Much has been written on this subject and many hours of TV commentary have been produced and many, if not all of you, uh, have been watching or reading a great deal of it. Events not only in the United States, but throughout Europe, suggest that the democratic order that has existed in Western Europe and North America, and that spread rapidly through the Americas and eastward following the collapse of the Soviet Union in more recent years, is now being questioned and increasingly challenged. Is this the beginning of a major shift in how countries are governed, or merely a momentary pause in the arc of history, a long-term trend or just a short-term response to economic dislocations? Is our democracy in peril? And if so, is it strong enough to resist the existential challenges it faces? Our debaters today essentially need no introduction, um, but for the three of you who have not been here before, 
Uh, let me just say a few words about each. Uh, Peter Radford is currently the president of the Green Mountain Academy Lifelong Learning. He has degrees from the London School of Economics and the Harvard Business School, had a distinguished career in banking. He is the founder of the Radford, Peter, uh, the Radford Free Press and the co-founder of the Online World Economic Association, which he tells me now has 15,000 members. Derek Boothby uh, had a long and distinguished career in the Royal Navy, followed by an equally distinguished career at the United Nations, where he specialized in uh, global security and arms control, uh, where he emerged as a global expert. He is a columnist for the Manchester Journal and a frequent lecturer both at the Green Mountain Academy and at the Vermont Humanities Council. Both, as Gloria mentioned, uh, have been moderators of today's headlines. In the course of our discussions, we have come to appreciate that each side has strong arguments in its favor. It was equally clear that neither of the combatants <laughs> fell definitively on one side or the other of the debate. So we decided in the time-honored solution of a coin toss. <laughs> I'm going to ask a member of the audience, Rosemary Valero, to flip a coin. Heads, Peter will be the proposer and Derek the opponent. Tails, Derek will be the proposer. It is tails. No, nope, that's tails. The eagle is tails. <laughs> you want to verify this? All right. Okay. Now, first a reminder about the rules. Each speaker will have 15 minutes for an opening statement. We will then open to the audience. There are three microphones, I believe. I think Gloria has one, Ted has one, and Liz has one. Please wait when you're recognized for the microphone to reach you. We'll take about 40 minutes. Uh, Gloria said Q and A. No Q, only A. Only, only comments. Uh, because we want to hear from you, uh, your views on this uh, important, uh, indeed, uh, very important question. Um, then we're going to have approximately five minutes for closing statements from the two debaters. And following that, by show of hands, the House will vote for one or the other. I want to remind you that at this third debate, each of these debaters has won once. <laughs> so this is the rubber match, and your vote really matters. With that, let me turn it over to our first proposer. <clears throat> in Helsinki yesterday, the Trump reality show never fails to deliver. In the past few days, we've seen his remarks against NATO in Brussels, his undermining of the British uh, Prime Minister, <coughs> Theresa May, and yesterday in a public press conference in Helsinki, in the presence of President Putin, <coughs> he criticized United States intelligence agencies. This morning, direct <clears throat> Director of National Intelligence Daniel Coates, a former Republican senator, responded by stating that the intelligence assessment of Russia's, quote, ongoing pervasive efforts to undermine our democracy has been clear and presented to Trump in an unvarnished fashion. But all that is external and is not what this evening's debate is actually about. This evening, we're going to focus on the internal threats to our democracy. And as our democracy has said, much has been written on this topic in the past few months. Here's a selection of books, all of which are available at the North Shore Bookstore. The right answer, how can we 
and unify our divided nation. Democracy in America, what has got wrong, gone wrong and what can we do about it? How democracies die. How democracy ends. Fascism, a warning. Our democracy is in peril. These five words, I put it to you, are very heavy with foreboding. So heavy, in fact, that they are alarming. Can this charge really be justified? And I put it to you that I believe it can. The motion before the meeting contains the phrase, our democracy. So I'm going to address this topic in two parts. First, defining our in the widest international sense, in order to show how and why democracy has already failed in some countries and is now failing in others. And then secondly, narrowing it down to our meaning here in the United States, to show the ominous signs of, of similar failure in American democracy. A few weeks ago, over coffee at Dorset Rising, my erstwhile opponent declared, too much democracy is a bad thing. His coffee must have been very strong, as I'd never heard him say that before. <laughs> but it is worth asking, what is democracy? In general, by democracy, we mean a system in which sovereignty lies with the people. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Liberal democracy is an ideology, as opposed to communism or fascism. It's not a matter of Democrats versus Republicans. Government by elected representatives of the people, and the people have the right to, to elect other representatives if the first set don't deliver. There never has been only one form of democracy. Different countries have developed their own versions, each according to national history and culture and preference. And there are differences between liberal democracy and social democracy. And for the purposes of our debate this evening, I shall define liberal democracy as standing for the liberty of individuals, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to form political parties, and so on. Liberal democracy is not a matter of left wing versus right wing. All of us are, or should be, supporters of liberal democracy. Now, social democracy, however, has a more economic component. It speaks for social equity, economic intervention, and values social equity more than the liberty of the individual. And just as all bishops are clerics, but not all clerics are bishops, so too all social democracies are basically liberal, but not all liberal democracies are social democracies. And to illustrate my point, I would describe the form in the United States and the United Kingdom as liberal democracy, whereas the form in Germany or Finland or India is social democracy. Now, in the first federal pa Federalist paper in 1787, Alexander Hamilton made a very perceptive comment. He said, history will teach us that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number began their career by paying obsequious court to the people, commencing as demagogues and ending as tyrants. In the book, How Democracies Die, by two professors of government at Harvard University, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, they trace the actions by elected demagogic leaders who have led their countries in the past and those who are currently leading to democratic failure. How Mussolini in Italy in 1922 was invited by the king to be prime minister and form a government and then turn Italy towards an authoritarian system. How Hitler had great popular support in 1933 and became chancellor in Germany and then proceeded step by step to introduce authoritarian rule. How Chavez was elected by wide popular support in Venezuela in 1998 and then in ensuing years changed the instruments of government to maintain authoritarian control. And his successor, Nicolas Maduro, elected by a landslide just three years ago, arranged a new single party constituent assembly to usurp the power of Congress in 2017 and has since consolidated his power as an autocracy. And currently, we are seeing developments in Poland, in Hungary, and Turkey, where elected leaders are using their power to subvert established democratic institutions and bend them to serve the objectives of authoritarian rule. Now, as Wolitsky and Ziblatt say, 
Quote, like Chavez in Venezuela, elected leaders have subverted democratic institutions in Georgia, Hungary, Nicaragua, Peru, the Philippines, Poland, Russia, <coughs> Sri Lanka, Turkey, and Ukraine. In March of this year, we saw the established political parties in Italy swept aside by popular vote by those who have lost faith in the democratic system. Former leaders were replaced by newcomers who had no prior government experience, but a determination to, to, to implement radical nationalist policies. As yet, we, don't know, we do not know how this will turn out in Italy. Now, in all these instances, what have been the measures that have pushed democracy aside? First, by the election of the demagogue, determined to make dramatic political alterations, of course, and to make them by hook or by crook. And then either by frontal attacks on existing institutions of democracy, such as attacks on the press, attacks on the judiciary, or by appointing new leaders to the national intelligence agencies and the military, who then in turn fill important positions with like-minded, politically reliable staff. By intolerantly sweeping away long-standing political norms, such as regarding opponents as political enemies to be destroyed, rather than as compatriots who hold politi different political views and with whom compromise and consensus can be found. Again, to Levitsky and Ziblatt, quote, two norms stand out as fundamental to functioning democracy, mutual toleration and institutional forbearance. So far, so good. I've painted the picture of our democracy in this wide international sense. But let me now define our, in the more narrowly, and measure our current American democracy against these factors that I have outlined. And I put it to you that the signs of peril are ominous. This situation is not something that has developed only since the presidential election in 2016 and the application of Trumpian politics. The ingredients have lurked in American democracy ever since the very beginning. The arguments between the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, 1787 were sometimes bitter. And down the years, there have been several demagogues in American politics who have received popular grassroots support. Father Charles Coughlin in the 1930s, Governor and Senator Huey Long, Senator Joseph McCarthy, Governor George Wallace. And in more in recent years, we've seen the growth of polarization the chipping away of mutual tolerance and institutional forbearance. In 1978, Newt Gingrich was campaigning for a seat in Congress, and he was very blunt. Boy Scout words, he said, are lousy in politics. You're fighting a war. It's a war for power. This party doesn't need another generation of cautious, prudent, careful, bland, irrelevant quasi-leaders. What we really need are people who are willing to stand up in a slugfest. By the early 1990s, <clears throat> Gingrich was the minority whip and leading the charge to change the way of politics. And warfare became more virulent after Gingrich left Congress in 1999 and Tom Gillette, <clears throat> known as the Hammer, became Speaker of the House. And since then, an entire generation of Republicans has come to power with a take no prisoners attitude. You'll recall Senator McConnell's statement in 2009 <coughs> that the principal aim should be for Obama to be a one-term president. And in 2016, his refusal to take action to fill the Supreme Court seat left vacant by the death of Justice Scalia. <coughs> now, hardball and harsh words have been played by the Democrats as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Nancy Pelosi strong-armed Obamacare through the House when the Democrats had the majority. And later, Bernie Sanders described Republican efforts to repeal it as, quote, the most disgusting piece of proposed legislation. Disgusting? Why language like that? And both parties have indulged in gerrymandering when opportunity offered, politicians choosing their voters rather than voters choosing their politicians. So the result has been a very sharp rise in partisanship and a dysfunctional Congress and all too frequent absence of compromise and consensus in hammering out legislation. But all this is politics, and there is, or there should be, a difference between politics and governance. Harsh words are frequent in American politics, but there's a difference between fighting for election success and actually getting things done in government. And all this brings us to the past 18 months. 
the lack of tolerance during the 2016 election. You remember Trump encouraging the shots of Lockera and his demeaning epithets for other candidates as spilled over into the White House and the conduct of government. Trump himself is a disruptor. He upsets apple carts, and that is his deliberate style. We have seen persistent attacks against democratic institutions, attacks against the press and the media, attacks against the judiciary and the integrity of the FBI, attacks against the intelligence agencies, attack, attacks against the so-called deep state of other government agencies. And finally, there is now a threat to our democracy from an entirely different direction, using modern technology. It is from companies like Cambridge Analytica, funded by rich individuals with a specific agenda, using extensive data gathering from Facebook, Instagram, and others for the production of ap apocalyptic videos on social media. In March this year, a British television channel conducted an undercover investigation into Cambridge Analytica to explore the measures and methods by which that company has influenced voters in elections in Kenya, Nigeria, India, and Argentina, and in the 2016 election here in the United States. Managing Director of Cambridge Analytica on Hidden Camera said, it's no good fighting election campaigns on facts because it's actually all about emotion. The two fundamental drivers are hopes and fears, and many of these are unspoken. Our job is to drop the bucket further down the well than anybody else. With methods such as these, it is easy for demagogues to whip up baying crowds at campaign rallies. So, mutual toleration and institutional forbearance, so necessary for a functioning democracy, are now in a very short supply. Our liberal democracy is sliding down the very slippery slope that history has shown us has happened and is at present happening in some other countries. We've not yet arrived at an authoritarian rule. Perhaps America will become an anocracy with an incoherent mix of democratic and autocratic traits and practices, unstable government and possibly civil unrest. Whatever may be the outcome, one thing is at present certain. Our liberal democracy, as we've known it over the past decades, is now seriously threatened. It's not just in danger, it is worse than that. It is in peril, grave peril. I ask that you vote in favour of this motion. Democracy needs reform. Derek just said so. I agree with him. That is substantially different, however, from being in peril. Ever since the election of 2016, when, yet again, please I point out, the winner lost the popular vote and was elected only for a historical clock imposed on us by the limited vision and desperate deal-making of the founding fathers, <coughs> whom I, by the way, detested democracy with an evident passion, my left of center friends and a good half of old political scientists, constitutional lawyers, media pundits, assorted other house, uh, soft style experts have been bemoaning the, the kind of democracy we can add direct to that too. To listen to that, that lot is a truly depressing experience is stressful hair pulling out. The, the bookstore, where are you? The bookstore. Shelves are now grown under the weight. Well, actually, that shelf grounds under the weight of books, decrying the state of our democracy and its imminent demise. The roof is, apparently, well on its way to collapse, and there's not much we can do about it. Rubbish. The quick, a quick, uh, let's do a quick uh, post-Trump fact check. Go back to the halcyon days of late 2014, when we were not thinking about it, okay? Had you done a simple Google search, looking at articles and comments uh, about the decline of democracy, you would have come up with a staggering 55.5 million rep uh, responses. If you had just limited yourself to academia, you would have come up with 450,000 hits. Clearly, the end has been nigh for quite a while. 
but, and it is a humongous but, the end is not nigh at all. No, democracy is not in peril. In fact, it is in rude health. Huh? All right. <clears throat> I got the gospel. In rude health, yes. Okay, let's take a deep breath and think this through, uh, which is something we need to do. Quit the hyperbole, stop hyperventilating, deep, uh, quit, you know, deep breath, step back. <clears throat> Let's abandon hysteria and focus on a few facts. For instance, in the last few decades, and we'll look internationally, our motion doesn't restrict us just to the US, and Derek did take us there. The fact is that a number of the number of people around the globe living in countries with elections that actually count, as opposed to Russian elections, have, has risen remarkably. The number of countries considered democracy has risen steadily since World War II. Yes. There may be ups and downs in that trajectory, but there is a distinct bias in the trajectory. Democracy is spreading. There are setbacks. There it listed them. That doesn't mean that's imperiled. Uh, now, I admit, it's always been absurd, it was absurd back then to, uh, to, to announce the end of history, but serious competition to democracy is an astonishingly small field. Think about it. What would you be replacing democracy with in fill in the blank? Democracy remains the system of choice for people all around the world, as it is here. Even tyrannies like to pretend they are democracies. Those Russian elections may be rigged by the puppet master who runs the place, but he obviously wants to be thought of as someone who at least is quasi-democratically elected. Otherwise, why would he bother? A democracy's allure is that powerful, and it remains that way. So that's one fact. But that's the world stage. What about here? Well, as I said, eh, things are a little damaged. Yes, I admit that. But it is not in peril. We're in a state of change, not disaster. Another fact, in a recent survey, the vast majority of American voters said it was important or very important to live in a democracy. The actual numbers are 92% of Democrats and 81% of Republicans. It's a, obviously, democracy has a slight leftward lean here, but it's still a substantial number. <laughs> but the same survey, ironically, is the one that told us that over half of all voters think American democracy is either damaged or in danger. Not in peril, but definitely not in health. This, in essence, is the conundrum we need to resolve in order to assess just how close to the age we are. The resounding underlying theme that pops out when we think clearly about our circumstances it is that there is a clear gap between the promise and the reality offered by our government. It boils down to this. Any form of government has to pass the test of legitimacy, including democracy. Indeed, the bar is especially high for democracy since it has to be legitimate in the eyes of the majority or just about not, and not just some clique, individual, or small group of people. The majority of people have to believe in your democracy. Democracy has to deliver the goods to a sufficiently large mass of citizens for them to accept the rules, for those rules to remain legitimate. And that's where our crisis comes from. American government is not delivering the goods to the majority. In fact, it's falling far short. What, is, what does it have to deliver? What do I mean by things it has to deliver? Security, especially economic security, opportunity, a fair state, a reasonable prospect of prosperity, and all the other attributes of a decent life lived in a well-managed society. An American government is not delivering on that promise. It falls far short for an increasing number of citizens, and it's been falling short for decades. Derek alluded to that fact. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that the government needs to deliver everything. I'm not talking about as a socialist part of the world where government runs everything, because it's the policies of the government that have to deliver. It could be laissez-faire, for all I care. But the, whatever you choose as your policy set, they have to deliver the goods to the majority. And they haven't. But that's only half the problem. The other half is responsiveness. American government has become increasingly tone deaf. Our leadership appears oblivious to the life experiences of our citizens. And it's become stag staggeringly self-referential. 
aloof, ignorant of the lives being lived by voters, and most importantly, how the reality of those lives no longer matches the, the rosy mythology of America as a land of opportunity. Thus, we have a lapse, not in the belief in democracy, but in the legitimacy of the government that democracy is producing. It is not our democracy that's in peril. It is the grip our elites have on the pinnacles of power. Very different thing. They are bankrupt of ideas and need to be tossed out democratically. Hence Trump, democratically. Both our political parties are in crisis. Voters are no viscerally, if not fully, that neither has the answers to today's problems. Uprisings, uprisings are taking uh, place on both sides of the aisle, and the pressure builds to find new paths, new solutions, new policies, and new leadership. This is not democracy in decline. This is democracy in action. It's the exact opposite of decline. People are looking for answers. No, no, democracy is not in peril. It is doing just what we would expect in a crisis. It is allowing voters to upend the system. That is the system of government, not democracy itself. Step back. In a sense, this crisis is a function of the success that the West had in facing down the Soviet threat. Back then, democracy had a handy alternative for comparison. And let's face it, the Soviets set the bar pretty low. Western governments could fudge along and look pretty good, but no more. With the Soviet comparison gone, the West was forced to look inward. And that's when the source of legitimacy changed. That's when, no longer, sorry, no longer about the waving of the flag of freedom, now it was about delivering on that message of opportunity. The problem is that this shift coincided with a triumph of neoliberal politics within both major parties, and history records that the triumph was pyrrhic, to put it mildly, especially when viewed from the perspective of the average voter. The challenge and the problem was to continue post-war growth and the relatively fair distribution of the fruits of that growth, but the result was increasing stagnation and epic inequality. The gap between the promise and the reality yawned wide open. Add to this toxic policy failure, an epidemic of south to north migration, demographic shifts that threatened long-standing cultural dominance by some groups, and the subsequent loss of social cohesion in the demos of democracy, and the stage was set for what we're living through, a democratic response. <clears throat> no, democracy is not in peril. It is providing a channel for the upheaval necessary to shock our elite <coughs> back into the empathetic response to reality. And de democratic upheavals that lead to reform sufficient to shock elites tend to be, not, or rarely are, quiet or more, uh, smooth affairs. They tend to be rude, nasty, and laden with collateral damage. So get ready. That's where we are. The problem with democratic reform is that the American system of government, as Derek pointed out, was never intended to be democratic. To the extent it is democratic today, and the, and the Freedom House ranks it in the middling range of democracies, it is far short, it is, is still far from being responsive to the majority. Whatever level of democracy we have today had to be run from the hands of the prior regime. It was a long and arduous fight, and that fight is now continuing. Now, I can hear some of you thinking, wait a minute, that's the way it's supposed to be in our system. It protects the minority of the heavy hand of the majority. Good for you. Try doing that for decades on end. See if you can defy the majority for, for decades, for, for that long. Try doing that when it becomes the norm and not the exception for the president to be elected with a minority share of the vote. We've had two already in recent decades. How long is that tolerable? How long will the people put up with uh, permanent minority status? The majority. Try doing that when the Supreme Court is filled by justices appointed by that persistent minority. Four of our nine Supreme Court justices were appointed by presidents who did not get the majority vote. Try doing that persistently through time. People will push back. 
Try doing that when 70% of our population lives in just 15 states. That's 30 senators, meaning that under the American system, the majority of voters will be consigned to permanent minority status. By the way, this is the projection that will take place somewhere around 2040. And try doing that, all of this, while not delivering the opportunity or security that democracy is supposed to deliver. Democracy will bite back, and the majority will want change. No, democracy is not in peril. The fight for that next stage of democracy is underway. And like all periods of reform, as I mentioned earlier, things will get ugly before they get resolved. This is the beginning of that ugliness. It is not the decline of uh, democracy at all. It is the beginning of democracy's reinvention. Think Me Too. Think Black Lives Matter. Think about Papua. Think about all of the women who have poured into politics just this year for the very first time, who are running for office for the very first time, who never considered running for office. That is not a democracy in decline. That is a democracy reinvigorating itself. Two pages. Excellent. <laughs> Think of all of those women running for office. And, and, and just imagine this is that young woman who won in, in, in New York calling herself a democratic socialist. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, none of which suggests democracy is in peril. All of which suggests democracy is alive and well. The danger is not in democracy, it's in the t hold that the elite has on it. This is democracy stirring itself. It is democracy in action. No, democracy is not in peril. Reject this motion. It's the democratic thing to do. <laughs> They never disappoint, do they? <laughs> OK, the battle of the Brits over American democracy. <laughs> a perspective from across the pond is always a fresh and uh, refreshing perspective. So we now open the floor to your comments and discussion. Please be aware that um, what you say could very well tip the voting one way or another. That's what we want you to do. Become advocates uh, in, in this discussion period. Let me ask uh, two things. One, keep your comments brief. Uh, we want to hear what you have to say. Try to be as concise as you can so as many uh, have an opportunity to speak as possible. And second, a reminder to please wait until the microphone reaches you after I've recognized you so that everybody can hear what you have to say. So, the floor is open. Yes, right there. Oh, it's in. I was surprised that neither one of you mentioned the fourth estate. Uh, any demo the fourth estate, any democracy requires uh, compromise. It requires arriving at a consensus of opinion uh, a body politic arriving at some consensus of opinion. We are now in a situation where the fourth estate has been heavily damaged by digital technology. It's coming back. Digital technology is acquiring its own medium for reaching everybody with more equity than, but it, it, that's not clear that's going to happen. What has happened is the increased difficulty of reaching agreement. In effect, because of Fox News. <laughs> Fox News has, in effect, become the propaganda arm of Trump, both by the, the, ch the changes in the leadership there and his daily association with his key spokesperson, and the split in which uh, people of uh, both sides within the body politic are viewing uh, who they're viewing in the major media and how they're getting their information. So that in discussions with people of opposing views, you now have the state where they can agree on the facts 
They have different sets of facts. That really inhibits compromise. I'd like to suggest that perhaps what we're seeing on Fox News is coming out in part of something Peter said. A new revolutionary, um, Crane Brennan, who was a 50s historian at Harvard who wrote a book which was standard at the time, I don't know if it still is, Anatomy of a Revolution. He talked about three main steps of revolution. The first is the fever. And I think we saw that fever building up and then the temple boost when Trump was elected. And then you see the revolutionaries come forward and perhaps they are the people who feel underrepresented. And then you have a coalesce, then you have to see the revolutionaries coalesce. Well, perhaps Fox News speaks for those underrepresented um, revolutionaries that I know that me and my friends look down on sometimes. They are not elite. They are not, we don't see them as highly educated. But perhaps in America, especially under social democracy, they may be our new revolutionaries and we may see them coalesce. And I think it pays for us to listen as carefully to them as we do to the to the uh, media, representatives of the media that we're more comfortable with us, that we're more comfortable listening to. I just think it's less of a revolution and more of a hijacking. Okay. Yes. Steve. I might suggest that the uh, power of the lobbyists and the political action committees whereby money in the country has such a play is a seriously challenging democracy as we would like it to be. Hi. Um, uh, and Derek mentioned the two very important aspects of the decline of democracy. Keep the mic right close to your Yeah, mouth. okay, okay. Uh, actually, not necessarily. The decline's been going on forever, but it's exacerbated recently, and that is gerrymandering and the social media. But two that were not mentioned is the attempt to restrict voting rights, uh, uh, systematically by the Republican Party, and also the you know, part the money plays in Citizens United and other uh, aspects of the uh, legislation that have made this possible. But I'd like to make a, a point that uh, I think maybe is a little unusual, a little surprising. Uh, and this, I think, also comes from the book uh, Is Democracy Die? How Democracies Die. And that is that according to a poll, uh, when asked if uh, they would support the suspension of the election in 2020, if the president requested it, uh, on the grounds that the probe and other aspects of the electoral system are rigged and corrupt, would they support it? Would they agree to the suspension of the election? 52% of Republican voters said yes. And I think Donald Trump is quite right about his ability to walk into the street and kill somebody, and that he would have, I don't know how many, 40 million people supporting him, whatever he said, whatever he did. This recent business, well, this will blow over. In a few days, we won't be hearing anything about his colluding with, with Putin. Everything will be fine again. I think he has in his pocket maybe 30 or 40, well, let's say 40% of, of, the, of the population, 90% of the Republican who are willing to do anything, including destroy democracy, if he demands it, if he makes his case for it. That, I think, does, on its own, put democracy in peril. Um, I, I'd just like to say that I'm not sure Donald Trump, I hope he doesn't have 40% of the population what he had was 40% of the voters, and what worries me about democracy is that people aren't voting, particularly younger people. They're a bigger demographic than we are. They are really important to the next election. Good point. Lots of good points being made, George. That was one of the points I wanted. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> that was one of the points that I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, there, there are big money in this country uh, has been given 
a great deal of power by the Supreme Court. A little while back, they, of course, passed a decision allowing big money, big corporations, to spend whatever they want on, um, on politics. And I, I suggest that that was a disastrous decision. I think the polarization that the speakers refer to really started in the 70s after the great civil rights legislation of the 60s. Um, and they became polarized because of Nixon's swing to the South. Um, and until you really solve that, and I don't really have a solution, um, perhaps the speakers do, um, I think we're going to continue to have a continual state of turmoil because, in, in my judgment at least, the greatest issue facing the country um, is racism, okay? Um, and I think that really came to a forefront after the great civil rights legislation put a lot of pressure on the parties and therefore they became very polarized. I think every one of us in this room has a responsibility to make democracy work. And I think you have to ask, or we have to ask ourselves the question, is the majority creating chaos, or is it the minority that is creating chaos? And once you get that and figure out a way to get it to work by voting and doing all the other things, then democracy should work. I think that one of the hallmarks of democracy, one of the most important aspects of democracy is that people be educated about what democracy is, that they be educated about the values of democracy. And I think that one of the problems we have today is that all of those people who say they want to live in a democracy don't really understand what it is and what their responsibilities are to vote, for example, as, as uh, the point has already been made. I think that if we don't improve the quality of education in this country and teach our young people the values of democracy and not just history, but also give them um, the ability to use their critical faculties to understand what media they're listening to and what truth is, then democracy may very well be in peril. I'm not ready to say it's in peril. I'm ready to say that it's, it may be in some trouble, but I think that there are opportunities we have to change that. So many really good comments coming. I spent a number of years in the 90s uh, working in China, and one of the things that I was most struck by was how completely and thoroughly public opinion could be changed by propaganda. And you could, they, I watched in, the entire Chinese population change on, on an issue in the space of 11 months. And what concerns me most about democracy in today's world is the susceptibility of peoples, not just in the United States, but around the world, to propaganda. And I think that Cambridge Analytics, uh, Analytic Brother, were absolutely on target when they said that the votes were, were done on the basis of emotion. And without truth and without reason, I think democracy is in great peril. Yes, I'd like to build on what people have been saying about education and about the uh, young people becoming more involved in this issue. Because whether democracy is in peril or whether it's uh, something that we can reform and, and build on, uh, it's, it's not going to even be uh, a question unless we get the young people involved. But one of the things that's very hard in trying to get them to have media literacy and civic literacy is how do you get a conversation going? Because they're not going to read the books that are on the table. They're not going to listen to a debate like this. But I would propose that there be more things like what we see today and which has been noted all over the web is the front page of a tabloid paper in New York, if you have not seen it. The New York Daily News has an extraordinary cover today. And the New York Daily News knows that it's appealing to a very, very wide group of people, uh, and that anybody can look at that and get it. And 
What we need are things that will start the conversation with a diverse group of people, not just politically diverse, but young people, such as we saw the Florida group get together and start making things happen. Someone mentioned digital uh, uh, communications and the fourth estate. Well, if anyone understands that, it's young people. So if you haven't seen today's cover for the New York Daily News, do look at it and say, would this help in getting a conversation going? I'm not can, can, you, can you enlighten us <laughs> as to what, what, what did the headline oh, say? Uh -huh. um, it's the full front page of the New York Daily News. And across the top, it says something about treason. It says but, open treason. Open, right. open treason. Open yes. treason. And the, the thing that's extraordinary, there are little boxes of statements around, but the thing that is extraordinary is the cartoon. And it's a cartoon of presumably Trump in the middle, and he's holding the hand of Vladimir Putin. And up in the corner is a sign, Fifth Avenue. And the Trump figure is holding a gun. And over to his left is Uncle Sam, all decked out. And he takes the gun to um, Uncle Sam. It's a reference to the uh, statement that was made during the campaign that I can shoot someone down in Fifth Avenue and no one's going to do anything about it. But it's an extraordinary cartoon to start a conversation. And I think we really need ways that we can have that conversation. And the tabloid appealing to many, many, many different people of different kinds of level of education and background could put that forth today. They're trying to start a conversation. Thank you. Well, the, con the conversation is the 800-pound uh, the, the gorilla in the room. But how difficult it is to get started, whether a, a daily news headline is the, is, the, is the right way to get it going. The fact that we are in two camps that can't talk to each other and talk past one another is the central question, it seems to me, of, 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 our, uh, of our polarization. Uh, I know tonight we're here discussing uh, the, uh, the um, democracy at the national and international level to some degree. But let me just uh, say to all of you, uh, what, uh, the fear that I have is that democracy here in Bennington County is disappearing. Last March in Arlington, uh, we had 65 voters come out out of 1,900 to vote for a budget of $7.5 million school budget. It gets worse. In June, after 50 years, Bennington, the town of Bennington, decided to change their town charter. 6% of the 9,000 voters came out to vote to change the charter. We are losing interest in democracy right here locally, and we're in peril at the local level, I think, a lot more than we are at the national level. Thank you. I don't know much American history, but I think our fathers, founding fathers, were hung up in an agrarian society. And now, of course, we are in a different world. I think that the biggest enemy of democracy is plutocracy, which is very evident. I think you know something about American history. You used to teach it. <laughs> I think that now democracy, as we know today, is about 100 years old with full suffrage, which is um, only 30 years longer than the shelf life of communism. So in the general scheme of things, it's pretty new. And it's been through a hell of a lot of changes um, over that period of time, and there have been lots of challenges. And we've been here before. You know, Hitler was elected, Mussolini was elected. Or should I say, the court should have been over for Hitler, I'm not allowed to say Hitler, which is his truth. 
Um, but we're in a situation here, I think, that I, I agree with Peter. I think that democracy, is, as we see as we sit around here, is in full force. I think the fear is whether the leadership that was put there by the will of the people is going to take us in the wrong direction. And I think, you know, frankly, as much as I detest Trump and his nefarious, etc., if we'd have had Jeb Bush, we wouldn't see any changes. Sometimes you do need a disruptor. And the disruptor brings people that like us together to talk, to reason, to think. And many people get the changes that we need in order that we can preserve the democracy and it can move forward in a different but full life. As a long-time school board chairman, I'd like to suggest that one thing that makes democracy in peril, maybe more at the local level than anywhere else, is that we are rewarding schools mainly for getting uh, good scores on three kinds of standardized tests in language, in math, and in science. And you could have a wonderful curriculum about civics, and it wouldn't count for much. I think that one of the real challenges we have in maintaining a democratic system is our necessary dependence upon education. I think that one of the great problems today is that at the very basic education levels, neither history nor what we used to call civics are emphasized enough, if at all. Um, the reason that uh, it is easy for someone like our current president, and it has been in the past, for uh, people such as Hitler and Mussolini and the various uh, dictators in, in South America is because there has been two elements. Not adequate historical uh, or history taught in the schools on a widespread level, certainly at the, at the, at the more educated, the, the top levels, but not at the lower levels, and the uh, ability for a demagogue to get enough influence so that the people who are not properly educated think that they're going to gain something by virtue of what they are promised by a demagogue. We were very lucky, the world was very lucky, when someone like Hitler came along and promised in times of economic pressure on his country that he could solve the problem. If it wasn't for the United States, to come along and say, we're not going to tolerate this kind of thing from happening, then who knows if he had been able to take over the world as was his intent. None of us might be here today. When it happens in our country, who is going to take over? Who is going to solve the problem? That is where I think a danger lies. And unless our people are educated to understand how it starts and how it can be prevented, we are going to be in danger. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to offer my sympathy to Peter because of the events of this past weekend. I think he has an up and kill fight. <laughs> I'd like to propose a thought experiment. Uh, I've jotted down six prerequisites for the survival of democracy. An informed electorate uh, with moral character, legislatures that fairly represent, courts that are not politicized, legislative leadership that inspires allegiance to the common good, an economic system that delivers growth and protects those who are vulnerable, and finally a world that is not in such chaos that we can continue to enjoy the luxury of personal freedom and representation. I'm afraid that those various prerequisites are all in jeopardy.
always count on you, Bruce. <laughs> Good point. I think that the uh, problem we have is the Supreme Court. We can't expect dramatic change to come from the country with the Supreme Court that stands more thoroughly on the side of taking the rights away from people. I think that we have a struggle. There is a movement in the country. Women are, are out. Me Too is happening. They, they, it's an uphill battle because they've got to, any change that they might bring is going to be stopped by the Supreme Court that has continually worked to suppress the rights of people. That's a major issue. The other thing that we're not talking about is that there is employment. There are no jobs. Uh, the, the, the mass of um, um, Trump's supporters are the people who don't have hope. There's no work. And, and, and um, we're not facing the reality of the technological change that's brought to our businesses. There are no jobs. Jobs are going away. There's no way to make a living. We have to address that issue. How are we going to be alive, keep ourselves going? And those are big issues they are not being talked about. And um, I think we have a problem. All of us are about the same age. Use, use the mic. Yeah, here you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Closer. No, just closer. All right. Can you hear now? Yeah. All of us are about the same age. Um, a lot of us went through um, the protests about the Vietnam War and the civil rights. We have a generation of young people out there who've never gone through this before. And I don't know how we would go about doing this, but I think maybe something like this kind of organization, we can, as, as a group, we can reach out to young people and include them in these kind of discussions so that they do begin to learn what's going on. Um, that's just a thought. I think we have to lay a lot of blame at the feet of our two major political parties. And you have one party now that basically, in the race in Alabama, felt like it was better to have a pedophile than a Democrat. And then if we look at the Democratic Party, they made the um, Democratic Committee basically anointed a candidate without really giving anyone else a fair chance. And this is, this is the mess that we've got. I recognize in the defense of uh, Peter's passion position that democracy is not a problem. Actually, there's a solution. It was proposed first by Justice Lewis Brandeis. He said that the solution to democracy is more democracy. That's what we need here. Um, so I'd like to address very briefly um, a couple of points. One is um, that Derek engaged in a bit of an oxymoron, which is informed anxiety. Um, doesn't make sense, but he was very anxious about the state of American democracy and democracy elsewhere. Um, but I would point out that one of the foundational points of our colleagues in the Department of Government at Harvard is that those uh, countries that soared to the right of authoritarianism tended to have weak institutions. And that was one of some of the common threats, either because those institutions were relatively new, let's say permanent, right? Um, or they were inebriated with corruption, let's say Italy. Uh, but they were not fully functional, um, strong institutions. And that suggests a certain amount of hope for the North American version of democracy, because say what you will, the institutions are strong. You may think that some Congress folks are spineless, but the courts have been very effective in checking and making uh, some of the executive excess. To Peter's slightly understated loathing of the Electoral College, <laughs> you present the very seeds of 
the end of liberal democracy. Because what has changed in a number of countries, including ours, is that exchanges and differences on policy affairs, on uh, directions in which to take the government, the government for improved governance, has become a politics of grievance. Grievance has emotion only. It has the seeds of what the founders and a whole bunch of Asian intellectuals in the 18th century feared the masses, the uneducated, I'm not casting aspersions, the ones who vote on the basis of whatever their leaders would tell them to because they have nowhere else to fall on, including their intellect. If, in fact, Peter's democracy is the ranting of the ones who feel aggrieved, whether it's Me Too or Black Lives Matter or Kentucky Miners, the result will be a similar fracturing of the common bond around which institutions are based. And the only thing that will support us will, in fact, be the judiciary. And some people in the country are not happy about that possibility. So Derek, despite your reasoned anxiety, I think you're right. <laughs> All I can say is enough already. Um, I thought we were supposed to be a system of checks and balances, and we are not. That's not happening. Why isn't that happening? We're meeting, we're rallying, we're demonstrating, and what has that all brought us? I throw that out. Enough already. I can't help but sit here and wonder if in the 1930s, a group of people didn't get together in a library and say, what are we going to do? I speak as, a, as an observer yeah. rather than a participant in the uh, voting system in this country since I'm a British citizen. I spend time in Australia. I spent a long time in this country, and I spent a very short time back in my own country of England. And it's interesting to see how the three systems work, given they are all based originally on the British system. In Australia, citizens of the people who are eligible to vote are required by law to vote, and there are severe penalties if they do not vote. The gentleman from Bennington County over the other side there made the point about why aren't we getting voters? Why? Same in the UK, we're not getting people to come out and vote. And unless we get people to come out and vote, you will not get the democracy that we're looking for. I have hope, not based on what is going on at the general level or the political level that has been spoken about, but the appalling events that have taken place over the last year or two in mass shootings, schools. Young people are now being motivated, I hope, to come out and vote. The movements that we have seen through this country, the demonstrations we have seen by young people, who within, some of them are just about 18, hopefully by November they will be 18, and they will come out and vote. They don't vote because they're disillusioned. They don't vote because Congress is bound, as people have said, by Big Money, by the NRA. You can't expect people to come out and vote when they really think there's no hope. Why should I vote? There's no reason to vote because my congressman is bound by the Monsantos of this world, by the NRAs of this world, etc. How much money is being spent by the lobby, lobbyists in this country? And it's true in other countries, but particularly this country. Huge amounts of money are being spent by lobbying. We have military people retiring who have all the knowledge. I think we've got your back right there. Okay, I've, I've said it up and I've made my I would like, uh, before turning it back to the debaters to make their final pitches,
to just tell you how very impressed I am with the quality of the commentary that we've heard from around the room. This is a terrific audience. Uh, your engagement in the issue is heartwarming. Uh, and uh, whatever the vote may turn out to be, I think it's been a highly successful event. So with that, let's go, go back and start with Derek, and then we'll hear from Peter. Now, as in our previous encounters, I have much respect for my opponent and his lapidary delivery. <laughs> but on this occasion, he is mistaken again. I ask you to excuse him. He's a product of the London School of Economics. So he does him. In preparation uh, for this uh, event, both Peter and I prepared both sides of the argument. That was why we took, uh, had to take a, a toss of a coin. And several of the prominent points that have been made uh, <clears throat> trying to undermine my argument, I have in my other copy. <laughs> in addition to books, there have been many articles about the threat to our democracy. The Economist. Democracy, democracy's retreat. After decades of triumph, democracy is losing ground. How democracy became the enemy. This is how democracy, American democracy could end, and so on. In April, the New York Times printed this piece by Roger Cohen, How Democracy Became the Enemy. He pointed to the methods being used in Hungary and Poland by their respective governments to assert vehement nationalism and step away from liberal democracy. He, he, here's his list. Neutralize an independent judiciary, tick off. Subjugate much of the news media. Remember, uh, uh, Trump has called them the enemies of the people. Demonize migrants, we've seen some of that too. Create loyal new elites through crony capitalism and claim that the people's will overrides constitutional checks and balances. When one holds up that picture against what is happening here in the United States, the similarities are too close for comfort. I put it to you, they are much too close for comfort. When truth submits to power, criticism is not only disloyal, but it becomes treason. At the start of the Trump presidency, there were many who forecast that once he took the responsibilities of the office, the Republican Party would reassert its control and capture him. But instead, what have we seen? We've seen Trump capture most of the Republican Party in Congress. <coughs> Republicans need the support of the Trump base to be re-elected, and any criticism of Trump within Republican ranks is seen as treason. So we have a Republican Party that has sold its traditional soul for 30 pieces of Trumpian silver or perhaps I should say Trumpian tin, <laughs> and a Democratic Party that is still wandering around the political farmyard with no charismatic leadership, no sense of direction, like a chicken that has lost its head. Some months ago, Timothy Garden Nash, a professor and political commentator at Oxford University, gave an address under the heading, The Failure of Liberal Democracy. Commenting on the rise of populism, the appeal of Trump in the United States and the surge of nationalist sentiment in Europe, he argued that the liberal elites themselves had to carry much of the blame. Allied to economic inequality, there had been an inequality of attention paid by the elites to the working class. Journalists writing for the New York Times, or the, Le Gu the Guardian in the UK, or Le Monde in Paris, had penned very few articles about the circumstances of the working poor and too many left-wing and right-wing politicians had neglected the other half of their own societies, and so that neglect had come back to bite them. Yes, our democracy is in peril. So what then is the remedy? There can be no one-size-fits-all, as their situations in each country differ from each other. But Timothy Gart Nash offered some common denominators. First, without downgrading their own values, liberals must be more self-critical. Secondly, they need to address the inequality of attention. They should attach more importance to language and their message. There's a need for less technocratic elite language 
and instead messages have to be found to get into the echo chambers of the wider population. Thirdly, globalization has been a success for capital, but not for labor. And so liberals need to understand the concern of labor and address the need for a globalization that is regulated rather than being freewheeling. And finally, a healthy democracy depends on the energy of voters. And in recent months, we've seen a resurgence of voter interest. And as Mark Twain once said, politicians are like diapers. They should be changed often and for the same reasons. <laughs> So firstly, whatever views we may hold, we, the voters, have to show up and vote. Secondly, we need to be alert. We need to question the reliability of our sources of information. We need to distill sound information from propaganda. Liberals and conservatives alike must fiercely defend the health and vitality of the institutions that have served democracy so well, namely the freedom of expression, the freedom of the press, the independence of the judiciary, the rule of law, the values of tolerance and institutional forbearance, and the maintenance of the checks and balances so deliberately instituted so many years ago in order to ensure that the three instruments of government, namely the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, no one of the three should be allowed to gain over overriding power. Now, all this is a tall order, but democracy is not easy. It's hard work. It requires engaged as citizens. But actions such as these are necessary, for I believe that our democracy is in peril. So I ask you to vote in favor of this motion. And when November comes, whatever your views may be, for God's sake, show up and vote. Thank you. <laughs> summation of why democracy is not in peril. The list of things we have to do is apparent, and most of those things are already underway. One. Two, a lot of people around here, I was fascinated by the, 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 the conversation. Uh, and a lady stood up and said, I believe it was you there, fever, revolutionary coalescence. Precisely. That's what I was pointing out. We are in that process. Bruce's list of uh, uh, pitfalls around us all are solvable once we recognize where we are. Derek just gave an excellent list of all the things we need to do, and I agree with him entirely. That's why a democracy is not in peril. Everybody in this room understands the problem we're trying to solve. Look at the turnout. How can we save democracy in, in peril when we have a whole bunch of people turn up to discuss that issue? That is precisely why democracy is not in peril. You lot are sitting here discussing it, and you think it's important. There you go. We go. I don't need to go too much further, but I will. <laughs> uh, money in politics came up a couple of times. Matt Dickinson has come here several times, given excellent presentations uh, to a very similar audience. And in more than one of those uh, conversations, he has said his profession, the pol political scientists of the world, don't think money in politics is as, is as big an issue as the average person does. Why not? Because you can spend a whole boatload of money and still lose. And that, and that happens frequently. Where the money counts is in the lobbying side, and, uh, and side, side, the stuff that happens after the elections. Oligarchy. Somebody mentioned pl plutocracy. I think one of the issues, one of these, and somebody said lack of responsiveness. I believe it was you saying that. That was exactly my issue. When you get to a, a situation in something that, in a place that calls itself a democracy, if the government is not responsive and is not delivering the goods to the majority of people, if it is narrow interests, 
If it is talking about a very you know, series of numbers, it's a criticism I, think, I believe someone here made of the Democratic Party, then sooner or later it gets a kick up the behind and gets changed. And that is precisely the process we're going through. This is not democracy in process, this is, uh, in, in peril. It's democracy in action. That was my point. We may not like what's going on. We may not like the process of having Trump run around the world and call out all of our allies foes and all of our foes allies, but that's, this is part of the consequence of having an elite, a small group of people having run the country and not paid attention to the majority. The majority kicks back, which is the process that's, that, we're, that is going on now. Somebody else mentioned institutions. Mark. Institution, institutions are the one reason why I think we can all leave this room and say, yes, American democracy is not about to disappear. We actually do have an investigation being conducted by the Department of Justice right now into the, uh, into the activities of the, the, that took place in the last election. The president may not like it. Tough. Tough. That's just the way it is. That's an institution that is working. I don't see why all of this hair uh, tearing out. Jobs. Somebody mentioned unemployment and the, and the future and the, and the future work. I believe I, I can't f uh, remember who it was. Uh, neither party. That was my other point. Neither party has responded to what's actually going on in a lot of people's lives. They've been responding to small interest group types of uh, situations. The people then kicked back, and that's the process we're under. I believe, as a consequence. The democracy is not in peril, it's in action, and you should reject this fallacious. <laughs> <laughs>
Not enough, Peter. But. <laughs> All right. Um, two final com uh, points. Um, one personal and one institutional. The institutional point is that uh, this really is the third time that we have heard these two guys go at it. And there is a sense that um, maybe uh, this particular uh, pair has run its course and the time has come for others to step forward. There, there you have it. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> Finally, on a serious and, and, and personal note, I wanted to just make a personal reflection on what we have seen over the last two or three days. Um, commentators from across the political spectrum have argued uh, that the president has, in fact, failed to fulfill his constitutional responsibilities, that he is failing to adhere to the oath of office. Um, there's been widespread commentary to that effect. Uh, there has been so also significant commentary that our national security is in crisis because of what happened at, at Helsinki. Um, the institutional question that has been here, that Mark raised, that's been before us, it seems to me um, comes to this. Uh, are our institutions of checks and balances sufficient to avoid a constitutional crisis? Do we in fact face the possibility of a constitutional crisis? And does Congress have a role to play in the resolution of that question? I, I leave that thought with you, uh, not as a, not as a, uh, it is a, as, as a question, not as a comment. But it seems to me that it arises naturally from the debate we've just heard and from the events of the last few days. Um, thank you all very much for your attendance. It's been a great evening.